So um, we actually have still a few minutes left, uh, even though it's very late. And uh, I'll be very, very quick, because uh, I'd like us to save uh, the remainder of the time for Alex Krieger for some concluding uh, remarks, and to Raul Marotra, who has been very patiently sitting here listening to everything that has been unfolding over the last uh, day and a half and incorporating all those things. So we're looking forward to, uh, to hearing a few comments from, from Rahul. I want to um, thank you all for uh, being here. Uh, our alumni, our students, our faculty, I think we hear you. We have listened to everything that you've had to say. We won't forget the things that you have said to us. I think it's very important for a day like this to be as much about the presentation of um, arguments and positions, celebration, and of course, the listening and the, and the incorporation of the things that are heard. I know that uh, we are a school that in terms of the kinds of uh, work that we do are about multiple disciplines, are about multiple practices, about multiple scales, multiple locations, and multiple desires. I think it's very important to acknowledge the fact that we are constantly engaged with this issue of multiple desires, the desires of others, and the desires of ourselves. This is the thing that makes it absolutely necessary for us to be constantly thinking about the relationship of the academy to the outside. At the same time, I think it's absolutely necessary also for us to have moments when we are, in a sense, distancing ourselves from the outside. This is a very important thing. A lot has been said in the last day and a half about reality. But institutions are both about reality and about the construction of certain kinds of imagination that actually need to distance themselves from those realities. And this is something that I feel very strongly that the GSD should be committed to the constant engagement and at the same time a kind of distanciation. The other thing that I want to say is that if we are to pursue the challenge that David Lee gave us, and I believe very strongly that we have this aspirational project. We do want to make a major difference. We do want to be players. We have to also be aware of the reality of the way in which we, in a sense, relate those aspirational uh, intentions with our researches, with the work that we do within the school. And that's why it is very important to see the last couple of days not as the presentation of a holistic, consistent entity, but really as a set of sections. These are just moments in terms of the life of our alumni, the kinds of people that work in the school, and perhaps the sorts of things that we will go on to work on in the future. One last thing. I didn't think today I was going to really talk about the uh, specifics of a particular project. But because it's been mentioned, and because I've got you here, and I don't want to let go of a certain sort of misunderstanding that seems to be in the air, and I want to clarify that. I think there, it, there seems to be a tendency, and I really, really appreciate uh, the generosity with which so many of you have spoken. And I really appreciate Andreas's validation of our efforts. But I think just in terms of the academy, it's also important that the work that we do has a certain level of precision to it. The last day and a half has not been about that. We have not tried to really put one topic on the table and go into it in detail. As I said, when you do this sectional thing, you have to assume that it's a partial story. Therefore, one of the things that has been mentioned 
is this idea of the coupling of certain words. The words have been ecological urbanism, landscape urbanism, and sustainable cities. I want to tell you that in my opinion, these three things are not the same thing. And I think it's very important for us to articulate why they're not the same thing. Because we go outside of the academy, and I know that in terms of common parlance, then this is all jumbled together, and it's seen as one thing, and it's not one thing. Last year, when I helped organize the Ecological Urbanism Conference, I can tell you, if I wanted to call it Landscape Urbanism Conference, I would have called it the Landscape Urbanism Conference. I made a book called Landscape Urbanism, the Manual for the Machinic Landscape. Within Landscape Urbanism, there are multiple positions. Actually, within the school, we do not agree on what this landscape urbanism position is. There are multiple positions, basically because this is a particular operative project without going into academic mambo jumbo. But it's very important that certain traditions exist, and they've existed before. Look at Paris. Paris is a kind of landscape urbanist project. It's Versailles implemented in terms of the city. This is not a new thing. So there are those people who believe in the juxtaposition of landscape and urbanity. There are those people who see that the project of urbanization, which has been focusing on the density of our cities, of the traditional, of the historic city, is not the answer to all conditions and all societies. And therefore, for example, in the context of the American city, there may be the need to think about extraterritorial, ex-urban conditions, sub-urban conditions, and address those sub-urban conditions through a lens of certain kinds of landscape practices that really brings in, for example, the dimension of ecology and sustainability in a certain way. In my own work, I have not been interested in that at all, actually. I try to focus on the operativity, the processes of landscape as a mode of thinking in relation to urbanism. It is not a landscape project, it's an urbanism project that is supposed to, in fact, learn from the processes of landscape in order to bring about both methods, methods of operativity, and this idea of the temporality of landscape as a mode of thinking about urbanism. I felt that the ecological project, however, should go beyond the specifics of this very, very particular, it's a small, actually, domain of investigation to something much broader, to be a kind of more, exclu to be a kind of more inclusive, larger scale enterprise that actually sets up the framework for many things to be included in it, not to make it into a kind of generalized mush, but to try through this, in through this incorporation, through this inclusiveness, to then really think about questions of infrastructure, questions of suburbs, questions of urban density, and really look for inspiration, to look for catalysts, for new forms of imagination that we could now think in terms of our cities. I hear from many people, like I did from some of my own colleagues yesterday, oh, sustainability, traditional cities, they're all, it's all a rule of thumb, it's all about common sense and things like this. I would argue it's not just about common sense. I would argue that it is actually about the discovery, the development, the setting up of the conditions that will produce, construct deliberately those forms of imagination if we cannot through the understanding of the circumstances of the contemporary, really think in a different way about a different kind of architecture, different kind of urban circumstance, then I think we, as an institution, have lost an incredible opportunity. So I feel the work of the GST is not about some kind of mere sensitivity and reasonableness in relation to the environment, but it's really about pushing the boundaries of the modes of imagination so that we really produce a different kind of thought, different kind of project. And that's why it's so hard. That's why it's so challenging. That's why it's necessary in our future conversations to really discuss, delve into the specifics of our differences. I think it's only then that we will be able to really uh, see 
the, the work of the school uh, as making a contribution both to this social project, to this aspirational project, but also hopefully in both significant, but at times it would be very modest ways in terms of the research work that we do uh, in, the, in the studio. And I very much hope that the future events and conferences, now that we have really had this more sectional approach, will delve into some of those, uh, some of those uh, specifics. So I hope you, you, um, you understand that, that uh, it's uh, how, how I really appreciate everything that's been said and that we really will uh, learn uh, a lot from all the things that you have told us and that you, I very much hope that you will also engage us in the same spirit of openness with which we have tried in the day and a half to really see the school, open the school to all sorts of, 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 of comments, positive and, uh, and critical, that that will really guide us forward um, uh, in, the, in the months and years to come. So hopefully Professor Krieger will, uh, will uh, tell us what, uh, what some of those uh, items are going to be about and, and Rahul Marotra will, uh, will, <laughs> will lead us to the future. Thank you very much. I think I'm here to introduce Raoul, primarily. <laughs> uh, however, uh, a couple of things. Well, thank you to the Dean, of course, for supporting this uh, all along. Without him, it wouldn't have happened. Let me identify three other people who, without whom, this certainly would not have happened organizationally. Three people out of the Dean's office. Uh, uh, and if they're in the room, if you could kind of wave your hands. And Brooke King, who organized much of this, uh, uh, Meg uh, Homan, uh, and uh, Kate uh, Ryan. Uh, so thank you to, to the three of you. Right. Yes. Uh, and we, we will get to the cake and the champagne in a few minutes. But I, I want to echo something that the dean said. Well, I would echo everything that the dean said. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but actually, it's your arrival and your participation that has enabled this two-day session to take place. And I really uh, mean that earnestly. And having listened uh, for two days very intently to all that's been said, I'm actually, I actually would like to kind of, in my own words, uh, uh, describe what I think the core values of the urban design program might be, not urban design in all of its fantastical uh, uh, definitional possibilities, but for the urban design program at the GSD. Uh, Andres uh, recently called me level-headed, think of it as a kind of a level-headed manifesto for the urban design program. Uh, so eight points, uh, uh, not necessarily of light, I guess. Uh, we in the urban design program seek to teach uh, and to help each other learn, rather than to proselytize, or to have one discipline conquer another. That seems kind of self-defeating. Uh, we study, we observe, we critically analyze, prior to presuming to know what the answer is. We respect human settlements uh, as complex, spatial, social, environmental, engineering, economic, uh, technological entities, not readily subject to predetermined, distilled, sanitized pattern making. We respond to the renewal of, 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 of central cities, the construction of new ones, uh, the preservation of old ones, uh, the management of peripheral growth as separate problems, not the same problem, requiring different analytical tools, uh, different planning and design tools. We study urban history as that time on, for, so that time-honored precedents uh, and places and their physical manifestations, whether they be streets, blocks, plazas, parks, neighborhoods, institutions, uh, uh, we study them for the purpose of deploying them to suit contemporary lifestyles and social purposes, not to assuage fears about the imminent future or uh, the present. We are determined to better understand ecological factors and are ready to agree that we haven't done so very well in the last several decades or longer. We understand that our uh, roles in designing urban environments absolutely are critical, uh, but are contingent upon uh, the input of sociologists, economists, healthcare providers, mayors, engineers, uh, investors, and so forth, and that a reciprocity to that input is an essential component of our own modes of discovery. 
And lastly, we seek, to, uh, we seek innovation. We always seek innovation from our students, not for novelty's sake, uh, nor to catch up to the future, uh, but to minimize uh, those agreements made over lower common denominators that so often takes place and so many of you have talked about while listening to the public, of course, but at the same time advancing humanity's aspirations regarding uh, the possibilities of urbanization. So with that, I turn to the chair of the Department of Urban Planning Design uh, to uh, uh, summarize and clarify <laughs> and lead us into the future, uh, Raul. And let's welcome him. Alex, thank you. Well, summarize, that's absolutely impossible. Uh, but anyway, good evening. Uh, this has been great. Uh, and uh, you know, many thanks to Alex, really, who drove this conference and sort of made it all happen with support from our dean. Uh, and I think these discussions have really been extremely valuable, especially to me. I mean, coming into this position from a selfish uh, sort of perspective, I think what I've absorbed, learned, listened to, I think these will be extremely valuable. And uh, I can assure you they'll continue to live in this building and in our minds for a long time. Uh, I I'm also really delighted to be sort of stepping into this position. And of course, I can't summarize what, what has been discussed. That's too complex. I mean, you know, they say today, in today's world, if you're confused, it just means you're thinking clearly. I hope that's true, uh, because this has been just really intense. But, I, but what I do feel after listening to the conversations for two days uh, and these discussions, uh, I think I, I do feel a sense uh, of the unfulfilled potential of urban design uh, at 50. And I think uh, this is something I sort of strongly go away with. Uh, listening to both the brilliant, you know, I mean, the two days of these brilliant interventions, uh, some nostalgic, some incisive and projective, I could not but help feel that somehow the original spirit mission that it all set out to sort of achieve is resisting desperately from being trapped in a kind of singular definition and paradigm of urban design. Now, that sort of struck me very strongly. And I think more than anything, uh, it's the changed circumstance in North America uh, that is rendering, uh, I think, some of these original intentions important in this context. And of course, there's a lot of anxiety that is sort of emanating from this situation. And this is something that sort of struck me as I sort of uh, listened to the conversations. And I think someone pointed out yesterday, this was very, very interesting and educative, that CERT sort of, uh, of course, recognized, uh, and maybe this is the last time I'll refer to CERT, because we're going to have that throne-breaking ceremony, I think, over Champagne. Alex has organized it. Uh, but uh, I, I think he identified uh, the, the, the difference between the uh, emerging urbanism here in the United States and what it required in terms of responses and the reconstruction project in Europe. Uh, this is sort of switched now, and I think this is the circumstance I'm referring to. I think we need reconstruction here in the North American context at many levels, not just the physical plant of the city, but the fabric of the city, the policies, the structures, the institutional delivery systems, the implementation, and as David said, sort of the meta-narrative that drives drives us and inspires us towards this. And sort of this reversal uh, is something we must recognize because those or original intentions are becoming anxious because of this changed circumstance. Advanced capitalism and democracy are hellish combinations for cities and for urban design. I mean, this is absolutely incredible that we can even manage to operate in this situation. The impatience of capital, which of course is diminishing now and unfortunately playing itself out in many other landscapes around the world, is something that is the biggest challenge for urban design as we seem to want to define it, know it. And I think this, this situation where the market determines so much of what ought to be done and the frenzied pace of urban development is perhaps not even relevant here now in, no in the North American context as much as it used to be perhaps. Uh, and I think this anxiety therefore of protecting the kind of identity and perhaps the market share is part of the sort of anxiousness that we saw in some of the discussions. And this is the trap because uh, what results from this are boundaries of containment. 
Uh, and somehow this is in complete contradiction to that spirit or mission that I was describing, which is the bridge metaphor. Uh, uh, urban design as a sort of bridge practice, one that implies flows and opens up a practice that is plastic, that can reconfigure itself depending on the problems, the agents, the actors, the scales, the territories, uh, and, and, and a whole lot of constituent sort of elements that form part of this dynamic and, and that, they have to, that, they, that it has to influence. And so I think Alex referred to this uh, 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 marginally about the product of it being a product of multiple forces, pulls and pushes. But this idea of a plastic practice a pla a, that's plastic enough to reconfigure and configure itself between built form and the broader ecologies of the planet, uh, in my understanding, is I think the spirit that needs to be charged up again, needs to be inspired, and I think that can make a massive difference. As a student here at the GSD in the late 1980s, one of the things that I was made very obviously aware of uh, was the notion that advocacy was integral to the practice of urban design. Again, this is a debate I, I don't see surfacing, and I must you know, point, I mean, David Lee was the one who sort of brought this to my notice in the few months I worked with him in the kind of work he was doing, something I hadn't sort of uh, engaged with or been exposed to here uh, at the school. Uh, and I saw urban design as being about activism, about change making, about drawing the disciplines of architecture, landscape, and planning closer together, being the kind of conduit for the critical feedback loops on which the survival and the improvements of our cities and our broader landscapes depended. In the 80s, 1980s, and so you know, when I came back here, I was surprised that this had become so silo-like because I understood at that point in the debates we were having here that urban design could not be contained or be situated in the urban. Uh, it had to engage with the peri-urban regional. It had to be understood as a practice that simultaneously engages with these multiple terrains. In fact, it's obvious, I think, that the practice of urban design is perceived to have lost its potency because of its inability to embrace with these multiple landscapes. And I think this is something, of course, that surfaced and we must sort of recognize. And thus, enriched through these multiple critiques that we've been talking about, I think urban design really does, and I do believe has the potential of becoming a broader field, of reinventing itself, uh, of of expanding its domain. Uh, actually, this has already happened, uh, but I think urban design practitioners have not been articulate uh, or perhaps aggressive enough to claim these engagements. Instead, this claim has rightly so sort of emerged in the form of landscape urbanism, new urbanism, everyday urbanism, post-urbanism, re-urbanism, this and that urbanism, it's all over the place. And I guess the point is that they're all simul simultaneously incredibly valid voices and critiques that really enrich the frame or approach or practice that we call urban design. I think what Robert, Robert, uh, Roger sorry, referred to as expanding our toolbox. So with this reading, what is I think also implied is a shift in the imagination to the scale of the metropolitan, to the region and beyond. That will become the frame in which most potent solutions for systemic design interventions will emerge in the future. And that is why I think at the GSD to have rolled or created an ecological urbanism frame or armature gives potential to great transdisciplinary work to, and gives it tremendous traction in a sense as well as common ground, while also allowing the agenda of the disciplines of architecture, urban planning, and landscape architecture to maintain their own integrity and identity. Urban design, I think, in this scenario, then truly then can take on kind of a new meaning and become that critical project that we've all been sort of feeling we can't find. Uh, and I think that potential uh, is a very, very important one. So from this perspective, as we speculate about the future here at the GSD, we also look at the global south as a zone now where frenzied growth uh, is occurring. Of course, there are two conditions here that I want to clarify, and I think the last panel touched upon this, the question of democracy and all of that. And one is, of course, the landscape of autocracy and the other, the landscape of democracy. And there are many, many hybrid conditions which we must recognize sit in between. This political dimension, I think, has massive implications on the form of practice. And so for now, I think my references really allude to the landscapes of democracy, uh, which resonate our own condition here in North America. And I, do, I don't think, uh, uh, 
uh, honestly, I don't believe that there'll be a crisis of democracy. I think what we have to begin to discuss is that we need more democracy and we need deeper democracy. And I think that really is the future, which has implications in, on, on not only our role as advocacy planners and architects and urban designers, but also in our engagement with society at large. In fact, in this arena of the landscapes of democracy in the global south, urban design has actually evolved into many hybrid forms of practice, which often result in richer versions of the earlier conventional practices, uh, some of which we were despairing about. And I think integral to this new emerging approach are incremental strategies and many sort of feedback loops making the process of urban design increasingly dynamic. This process actually also challenges the conventional notions of urban design and blurs the difference between this sort of uh, obsession with developing the tools of advocacy, but also engaging in advocacy and kind of creating models that combine both. This is the urban, this is urban space advocacy, not as an end in itself, but one which constructs carefully calibrated bridges with other disciplines and constituencies, and more critically, society at large. Speculative thinking naturally becomes critical when engaging with advocacy, practice, or spatial activism. It becomes an anticipatory spatial practice. And again, this is why here at the GSD, we are incubating these two MDES tracks together with uh, critical and strategic conservation, both connected to the questions of new ways of engaging with the future as well as with the past. But it will also be part of the critical exposure to the training of the urban designer, and these linkages will become more formalized as these tracks evolve. So through speculation, the urban designer is then charged with making vivid for society spatial possibilities as instruments for negotiation in these landscapes of democracy. An extension of this renewed role then is the responsibility of the identification of new problems and new paradigms. I mean, I think uh, Richard's pointing out about asking communities what they know was, was really you know, a seminal sort of intervention and one that sort of resonates with what I'm sort of outlining here. So in these new engagements with the South, uh, they should not be about detaching ourselves or escaping from the problems of the North, uh, as is often sort of posed, but about using emerging paradigms in the, in the South as a reflective instrument for us to re-engage with the question of urbanism in the global North. And I think, I think there are inspirations we can find there. And it is, I think, through this exposure to a plurality of strategies that the practice of urban design will evolve and be enriched. It's historically been open to this kind of plastic condition, and I think the South can in, in, uh, uh, you know, uh, contribute to that process greatly. I mean, even what Pierre showed us about the crisis, this is a global one, and I think the South and the North are intrinsically linked, and you can't make binaries any longer in this sort of world we live in. Uh, so questions of equity, humanism, resource management, incrementalism, uh, and many, many other, the other sort of issues that will resonate even more powerfully in the present economic conditions in North America. These are, in fact, issues that resonate across the globe and can't be set up, as I said, as binaries, which will only inhibit collaboration and creative thinking. Of course, our responsibility also has to do with recognizing the need to engage with marginalized societies, engage with the production of knowledge in the context, but being mindful of the fact that the South has as much, if not more, to teach us and to learn. And this is the many urbanities that sort of was brought up um, often in the discussion. I think the critical question for urban design education is how we can embed Multiple, multiple ways of doing within the training of the urban designer or practitioner. Different models relevant for different conditions, problems, locations, how we equip students to traverse and negotiate these new territories and geographies. The, thus, urban design then looked at through this lens of multiple emerging model practices, uh, multiple emerging models of practices, opens up the discussion beyond, I believe, the narrow categories, which will hopefully dissipate the sort of anxiety that leads us you know, to make even more sort of narrow uh, boundaries. And with that sort of on behalf of the urban design program, the GSD, I would once again like to thank you for all having participated in this sort of really extraordinary discussion. And as Mohsen said, and Alex has mentioned, in this coming year, uh, and hopefully the next fall, uh, we will convene a second and a third of these uh, conferences more pointedly on questions 
uh, on sections specifically, uh, on new directions for urban design, on questions of our engagement with the South, with the global South, new emergent forms of urbanism, and the education of the pr new practitioner. This will be uh, a way of sort of book ending the 50 year celebration. But more importantly for us as a program and a department and a school as a whole, to speculate on where the future directions might lie and how these can be engaged with and articulated. We see sort of this mirror that we've set up and we we have used for our reflections today uh, in these last two days will hopefully become the window to new possibilities and to the unfulfilled potentials of urban design globally. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Raul. Uh, we're just about done. Uh, I think between Raul and the Dean and I, we've managed to thank everyone but the speakers themselves. So I think a, a round of applause for all the presentations. <laughs> and, and now there's a, apparently a birthday cake and some champagne waiting you outside in the reception. Thank you. <laughs>